This is John Byrne, the lead pastor here at Grace Fellowship, and this is the Grace Deep Dive Podcast, recorded deep in the depths of the Grace Fellowship basement here in Lakewood, Colorado. We dive a little deeper into Sunday's sermon. I'm Johnny McCloskey, and I'll be your host on the Grace Deep Dive Podcast. So uh, we are in episode 76. Welcome back. We're glad you're here. Um, we are going to be, since we are no longer allowed to be within six feet of each other, that means everything must go beyond six feet, even right. healing. Healing beyond so, six uh, feet. Yeah, that was the he, message on Sunday. Yeah, even Jesus was affected by the, the coronavirus, and he was uh, asked to, to heal without, you know, getting too close. Just kidding. Um, we're still in the series, Miracles. Uh, healing beyond six feet was this, the title this week, and uh, basically it had to do with, um, was it to talk about the centurion and the authority and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. he had the servant that was sick and paralyzed and whatnot. And uh, he said, go ahead, Jesus, just heal him, heal him yeah. beyond six feet. From beyond six feet. Yeah. And you, you kind of talked to a little bit of your sermon was about the idea of authority. A little bit. Yeah. I know that we're going through a lot of authority issues right now, just with government telling us what to do and all that and whatnot. And people, some people obeying it, some people not um, and whatnot. But you talked about how you, you, buck authority however you do not exactly of, what i said that's not what i said no, no. well yeah you buck authority but that's not what i said no what do you say i just said i got authority issues yeah yeah you have authority. okay fine doesn't mean, have I buck authority a, issue. doesn't mean i buck authority but sometimes i have to work harder to convince myself not to okay gotcha so you have you have authority issues yeah is that better sure and i can attest to that that actually no the other thing is actually you said what you said was, I have authority issues, but I'm pretty good with respecting police officers. It's not exactly what I said, but go ahead. What did you say? Go I, ahead. I, what I'm did curious you say? of where this is going. So, no, yeah. The, the funny thing is, so I, I've actually been in a situation with you, John, when the the law enforcement has uh, stepped into your your day to day living. When we were going out to Winter Park one year, and you got caught in a speed trap. <laughs> I was speeding. Yeah, well, or like Birthday Pass or something. Or yeah, well, I was speeding. Well, yeah, you weren't going that fast, but they, they had a trap and they got yeah. you. Yeah, Birthday Pass or something like that. They got you, caught oh. you speeding, and you were you were pretty respectful. You was know, I? you're a little bit frustrated. Yeah, but but you didn't you didn't talk back too much. I was I was impressed. I didn't talk was, back too much. That was also the same trip where we were driving home and uh, and we realized that uh, you don't have windshield wiper fluid in your car. And uh, you couldn't see out your windows. So we were taking snow off the side of the road <laughs> to try to make sure so you, you could see. So, what vehicle uh, was this? Do you remember what vehicle? This is like the Bronco, the blue Bronco. Oh, the Dodge Ram Charger. Yeah, whatever that was. Yeah, blue, big, whatever that is. So yeah. they're all the same to me. So yeah, um, that was a beast, man. That was it was a beast. I think it was almost overheating on the way back. <laughs> he so, probably was. Yeah, probably and was. I'm sure you had a pro- hard time with the authority of the uh, the dealership or the mechanic saying, "Hey, you need to fix this water pump." Nah, it's okay. It's okay. Don't tell me what to do. Not water pump. That doesn't. I'm just messing around. Windshield wipers. <laughs> no, I'm talking about your overheating too. Oh, I don't. I don't know what that was. I, I had a yeah. lot of trouble with that thing overheating when I went to the mountains. That's right. So, anyways, uh, so I've seen you in, in action with the authority, and you're you're pretty good. I'm pretty you're good. Pretty good. You're not name name rank and uh, registration, but you're pretty. Uh, did, you're still pretty good. Do you remember the time? I don't know if you even knew about this, but do you remember the time? You weren't there, but. Uh, I'm sure I talked about it. I got pulled over uh, on my way back from college ministry one time and, uh, and it turned out my license was suspended. Do, do I think I've heard that? about that. Yeah. Yeah. You had a warrant, didn't you? Or no? No, I didn't have a warrant, but I, I had, I had not that, not, not, not for that. That was uh, not for that. It's like I had a lot of, so lots of warrants. I did have a warrant, warrant out for my arrest one time uh, because I you gotta explain on that. Yeah. I missed a court date for, for what it was for like, something simple like uh i don't know speeding or i didn't have my insurance with me or something something along those lines you forgot and, about it yeah yeah and i just forgot about it and i and i missed the court date and and once I, when i realized it i think i realized it because i got a letter <laughs> saying there's a warrant out for your arrest i was like what and then so i called them you know i took care of it i called them i was never arrested um, oh good good i i went to court took care of it all that kind of stuff i think it was insurance because i, I brought my ins- i remember i had to drive like like it was the same same county. It was win, like Winter Park area. Maybe it was that same thing. I bet it was. It I might have been. 
I think I, I think because I think I might have gotten pulled over for speeding, but I, I got a ticket for not having my insurance with me. And so I just want to go to court because you just bring your insurance and they dismiss it, you know, is how that works. Um, and so I wanted to go to court, but the court's like, like three hours away. Yeah. Okay. And anyway, so I drove up there and took care of it, but yeah, so I do, I do have authority issues, but I, I generally am pretty good. My, my, uh, my, uh, mom knocked me down to sides a few times and, and, and taught me some good lessons. When I was well, there you go. There. So I, I, uh, I work hard at being respectful and listening to authority, but it is more work for me than, than maybe for some. Anyway, for more, there you go. Well, you know, <laughs> we basically, the reason why I bring that up is because um, the centurion definitely knew authority. You know, he understood how it worked. And uh, even him coming to Jesus, you know, he asked for a healing, but it was kind of a big deal because he wasn't Jewish, right? Yeah. So why yeah, why does that matter? Jewish. Well, by the way, I should, I should just mention just since the license suspended thing, just since I mentioned that and didn't explain it, um, I did, uh, they wrongfully suspended my license and I proved it and they gave it back to me. So just so you know. Sure they did, John. No, I did. It, I, <laughs> it, I got it back the ne very next day. It, it took a whole lot of hours on the phone, but uh, I got the right people to talk to the right people and it never should have been suspended just so you guys know. Okay, good. Yeah. So you're not a you're not a felon or anything. I'm not a felon, and yeah. uh, and I've never I've never rightfully had my license suspended. Yeah, well, I've never had my license suspended, so there you go. Yeah, yeah. But I'm also very very much the rule follower. I, I I wasn't not following rules. It was well, I guess I got it was a speeding ticket that they said I didn't pay, but I I proved I did pay it. And, okay, gotcha. Anyways. Well, cool. So yeah, the centurion. So you know why why you know I think I've always had a hard time when. You hear about that in scripture where Jesus kind of caters, almost caters to the Jewish people, not the Gentiles. So yeah, what, he, what, what's that about? Well, well, you know, I think you have to go back to the Old Testament and uh, the Jews are God's chosen people. But even if you go back all the way to Genesis chapter 12 with Abraham, um, the, you know, God chooses Abraham and his people, which become the Jewish people to be his chosen people but they are to be a blessing to the, to the world, right? To the, to all the families of the earth. And so there's always been since the very beginning, a sense in which God's chosen people, which was originally was the Jews um, or the nation of Israel were, were to be kind of an outreach organization. If you want to think of it that way, they were, they were to, to be a blessing to the world and, um, and, and to proclaim God's goodness to the world. And so, and so there was a chosen people in the new, in the first century in the new Testament, when Jesus was doing this, this, that was still true. It was still, Israel was chosen by God to, you know, be a blessing to the world, but they hadn't really fulfilled that. They turned their back on God a lot and things like that. And there's been, there'd been judgments and all kinds of stuff. Um, but, you know, but there, there's a transition, I believe in, uh, in, you know, in the New Testament, I think we see a transition from God's chosen people being the Jews alone to now it becomes, uh, you know, the Gentiles are grafted in, right? And so we're kind of in that process where Jesus is, is making that transition. Part of the reason for that transition, I think, is, is the Jews were not um, doing what they were supposed to do. And really, God's, God's uh, goodness was always to be, be proclaimed to the rest of the world. They were always to be brought in. I mean, you read in Isaiah... Um, I, I forget which chapter it is, but you read in Isaiah all these nations gathering uh, to 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 God, and, and it's a, very much a picture of what we again see in Revelation of all the nations coming together uh, to worship God and and those kinds of things. And so, so that's always been the case. Um, but I would I would argue that uh, at least in some senses and in some ways, the church now is God's chosen people. And that includes not just Jews, but Gentiles, anybody who follows, follows Jesus. And that to some degree would have been true prior to that too, but, uh, but it was less, um, you didn't, you just didn't see it, see it as much. And there was almost More an a, arrogance and a pride that, that some Jewish people had in that regard. Well, it seems almost too like the plan wasn't fulfilled yet. You know, the, you know, he had, the plan was always to bring everybody in maybe, yeah. but it, it just hadn't been fulfilled. But I've always had a hard time even with that scripture about, um, you know, pearls, you know, don't cast your pearls before swine or whatnot, too. It seemed pretty harsh. Well, I mean, I have to go back and look at the context. I'm not sure that that was 
in relation to Jews and Gentiles. Maybe it was, but I, I can't remember the exact context. I have to okay. go back and look at that. But you do have the Syrophoenician woman, right? And she, and she, uh, you know, and then again, that's a healing uh, story. Um, and and uh, she basically says, you know, Jesus comes and says, I, you know, I, I the Jews are God's people, basically. I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I'm not looking at it or anything, but, you know, and she goes, yeah, but even, um, you know, even dogs eat scraps at the table or something like that. And then Jesus kind of concedes and uh, to, to her request. And so, so you do have these kind of instances, but, but the important thing isn't that there was a tendency to favor the Jew. The important thing to recognize is that it was, it was, it was uh, that Jesus transcended that cultural boundary. He went beyond that. He went beyond and went to the centurion. You know, he did heal the centurion servant. He did heal, you know, heal the, you know, with the Syrophoenician woman, he went and beyond that boundary. And so, and so sometimes we focus on why, why did an exception need to be made rather than the exception that was made. And so we need to focus, Hey, he, he made the exception. He transcended that or went past that boundary. I think it's always good. Like you said, even just to go, you know, I, I got to read the context of that. Because I think so many times in in uh in our society or even in the church, you'll see a lot of times where people just kind of go by the gut, you know, and yeah. they don't like it. And it's like, well, read the context and see kind of what, what the point of the passage was, and uh, you know, and even understand that the 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 culture was very divided, you know, and there was even maybe a, a sense of of the woman even kind of projecting that we are a subclass, you know. Right. Right. to you guys and it's like well jesus didn't feel that way maybe you know you don't you so you got to look into the you got to read it actually read it so right. i mean yeah go ahead well no no i i, I had, it wasn't saying anything i was just kind of agreeing okay you, you have to read the context um you know the the casting the swirl be be the pearl before swine the swirl before pine the, wow <laughs> wow that was the Did you have a stroke before, what's that did you just have a stroke, John? Yeah, that maybe. happens to me know. sometimes. Yeah, yeah, mix up those letters, um, you know. But but that was you know really in the context of Matthew seven, right? And and Jesus where he says, "Don't judge others," and and that kind of thing. Um, you know, the sawdust in your you know taking the plank out of your own eye before you take the sawdust out of your your brother's eye, uh, that kind of thing, and definitely addressing hypocrites. And and in that tech context, I would actually suggest that the the swine is not um it's not like gentiles it's actually like the pharisees um and so and so jesus is actually kind of calling the swine the pharisees are the swine they're jews so i don't i don't think that that would be racial as much as um speak to more of an attitude of people who don't want to hear or receive the message of god and so don't waste your time gotcha there you go that makes sense so there's a little context for you. That's it. Just at a quick glance. I just went and looked it up because I couldn't remember the exact context. And, but yeah, it comes from that Matthew seven sermon on the Mount passage. Okay. Which is, cool. just a couple, which is just the last chapter because we're in Matthew eight. So, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that, that, there you go. So let me ask you this then, John was the centurion. Did he have a realization that Jesus had authority and that he had to go through chains or that he was in a certain position of authority, spiritually speaking, not just, uh, yeah, I think he did. I think he recognized it. I think that's why, you know, I can't prove that he, he traveled um, from Caesarea to Capernaum. I think he probably did. Uh, I don't know that for sure. Just because the headquarters was in Caesarea doesn't mean that, that he was from there. But, but, but there seems to be a distance issue, right? Like, like um, you know, and, and the NASB and the RSV will, will make it as a statement where Jesus says, I'll come and heal your servant. The NIV, I think, gets it right because of the way the wording is put in the Greek. I think it was a question where Jesus said, do you want me to come and <clears throat> come and heal? And, you know, if it was just a block or two away, then I think it's more likely he would say, oh, yeah, sure. But he probably came from some distance. So I think probably came from Caesarea. And and for him to do that, he he most certainly recognized some kind of authority or power in Jesus and, 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 and knowing that if I just go and talk to him, he can be, he can make this happen. At least if the stories he had heard were true. And if that passage in John four, it, maybe that was a separate event that he, that this uh, centurion had heard about, <clears throat> um, which is a possibility. Um, then, you know, then he would have recognized that and said, and said, no, he can heal. He doesn't need to be there. He is, he's got the, this power and this authority to heal. 
Um, and we'd see the authority is a theme. Even at, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, they're talking about, oh, wow, look at w- with what authority he taught and that kind of stuff. And then in, in two of these um, miracle stories here in the beginning of, of chapter eight, authority is kind of mentioned. There's a theme here that, that Jesus has authority. He's, he's different from other teachers and stuff in his authority. So mm. yeah, I think that was a, that's a big part of what's going on here. John, is it a, a cautionary tale for us? Because if you look at Jesus back in the day, I mean, he had, he was a big deal. People were coming from miles and miles away to come and, and hear, because word was spreading about him. People were coming. He had followers in the thousands, tens of thousands. And then, uh, you know, then you have the Palm Sunday where, you know, Hosanna, and then all of a sudden they don't get what they want and they turn away and they crucify him. Is there a cautionary tale for us to go be careful that we don't look at God as just the genie in the bottle, just the healer, the always just the, you know, give me this, heal me of this, um, you know, and whatnot. Or should we, should we be looking for more than just yeah, grab, I think, whatever that is that we're missing? You know, I don't know if you've noticed, but I haven't, even as we, we've talked through these miracles and this will be true this, this week too. Um, the miracle itself is cool amazing whatever uh you know you want to call it but the miracle itself isn't the point the fact that jesus healed isn't the point that it, it's almost like jesus did a miraculous object lesson this is about something else this is about something greater and bigger than just jesus doing a miracle it's, it's not just a magic trick for entertainment or something like that and so we need to understand that i think a lot of times when we pray for jesus to do things to heal us or to take care of a situation we're praying for an immediate need and there's nothing wrong with doing that. We should, we should do that. We should bring our needs and our concerns before Jesus. That's a good thing to do. However, we should also recognize that when Jesus chose to heal and he healed a lot of people, um, it was always for some greater purpose of proclaiming who he was or proclaiming God's glory or in John, in when he talks about the, the, the miracles of Jesus, he, always seems to speak of them so that people would believe that's kind of a theme throughout the throughout the fourth gospel of john not not the fourth gospel of john the, the fourth gospel which is john <laughs> fourth gospel, comma john <laughs> yeah get, get the punctuation in there right so you guys don't think i think there's a fourth john or something but what's your kind of is there's yeah there's three in the back and one in the front yeah yeah not gospel the fourth i'm talking about i'm talking about the uh the fourth main gospel which happens to be the book of john (laughs) yes (laughs) anyways uh uh you know in that one it's it's all these miracles are presented so that so that you would believe so there's purposes beyond the miracle itself the miracle itself isn't the point it's it's to point to something greater something bigger and so I, th- I think we need to recognize that when we look at the miracles of Jesus and, and, and we'll continue to do that because there's, there's a larger point being made by Jesus pro- doing that miracle. He does have compassion and those kinds of things. And those are reasons he does it, but he's also doing it to bring glory to God or so that people might believe. Oh, excuse me. Or did you yawn? I'm going to blame you. Did you yawn a minute ago? I yawned about two minutes ago. See, it just took it's me. completely, it's completely contagious. Just so you know, people Absolutely. try to admit. It's, I like that it's not prevented by distance, like the coronavirus. Yeah, I think MythBusters try to try to to prove that it wasn't, or try to figure it out. They proved that it wasn't contagious, and I still think no, it is. Every time somebody not? yawned, yeah, that's what they said. I mean, yeah. go look, look it back, yeah. but look back, but it was, it's totally contagious, hundred percent. Yeah, I think they're wrong. Uh, but anyway. no, that makes sense. I think I think it makes sense because you know I think when we when we when we approach God a lot of times it's so that we can receive that healing or so yeah. that we can receive that whatever it is that the the fix of you know I need the money or I need whatever. But the reality is we get lost sometimes. I think that's probably the cautionary tale is it's not just about the miracle. It's not about what He did for me right now in this moment. It's really about what He's what he's always doing what his end game is you know and it's not you know it's always the point back to him everything's the point back to him and not for us i think sometimes we become very self-centered in our miracles we become self-centered maybe in the, in the gifts of the spirit too in some ways sometimes you know we can brag about you know whether it's tongues or um you know healings and all that kind of stuff we can become very excited for our own sake um and and maybe 
take over that a little bit. And I think it's good to have, feel free to correct me if, if you think I'm wrong, but it's, it's good to go that this is a still a God thing, you know, and we just need to be careful with that. Yeah. I think, I think when we ask for miracles, no, I totally agree. When we ask for miracles, it's usually for our own sake. Um, and, and I think that I'm not saying we shouldn't ask. I'm just saying when God heals, it's not, it's not always for our sake. It's almost like our, it, that's, that's an added fringe benefit It's for some other purpose or reason um, that is important for God's ultimate plan. And we think too far too much of our own, in, own uh, ailments or uh, I was going to say inconveniences, but they're, they're often very much more than inconveniences, but our own situations we think far too much of those and not nearly enough of God's ultimate plan. And God, God does miracles for his ultimate plan, for his ultimate purposes. And even in his ultimate plan, sometimes it comes out of saying, no, I'm Absolutely. not going to. And I'm still going to be That's glorified right. because of that. Paul talks about his suffering a lot. Um, you know, we think of Job. We think of a lot of situations where people suffered and God used that for his glory. And so our, even our suffering has purpose and we should take comfort in that. Mm -hmm. ah, comfort and suffering. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. There, there you go. Hey, John, um, kind of talking about authority and obviously we're in a situation right now where even you were talking about how you were on a, uh, a, a call with the, the governor or whatever, or the governor exactly. of Colorado. Yeah. It's not like I got to talk to him. I, I, no, I, I, know, I, but actually, you're... I actually wasn't on the call yesterday. I just got the notes from, it was like a big conference call, but gotcha. I've been on so, calls with him before. It's, but there's a chain of command, right? And I know, yeah. and, and, and you'll see even right now, we're obviously going through this coronavirus. If you're listening to this a couple of years later, 2020. Or yeah, in, the, or, yeah, the year you should avoid, right? Yeah, but, right. The, the decade's starting out so well. Have you seen that meme with Back to the Future? And, and, and uh, um, no. what's his name is telling Michael J. Fox. Uh, I can't remember Michael J. I can't remember. Christopher Lloyd. Marty, Marty McFly. Right? Yeah, Marty. He's telling, he's telling Marty, he's, he's like, whatever you do, don't go to 2020. <laughs> don't go to 2020. It's <laughs> terrible. Yeah. But no, I think, but it, it's funny because, you know, you know, we, we know as Christians that we are not to, you know, so like there's a chain of command, you know, there's, you know, you're submitting to the chain of command and, and we're supposed to obey it. Is there a time where the church shouldn't obey the rules of the government? Like you start, even right now, you look at some churches and even some restaurants that are um, kind of saying, you know what, you say we're not going to do it, but we're still going to meet. We're still going to to sell to people. We have we have rights and all that kind of stuff. Is there is there a time where it's very clear that the church should obey and, and so the situation, and then maybe not? Well, I don't know how clear it is, but yeah, there is a time. I don't I don't know where that is uh, exactly. And trying to, you know, and and I've thought about it a lot in this situation because. We were told not to meet. Um, I, most, the vast majority of churches are going along with that. There's one here in Lakewood that's kind of uh, told the government they can, you know, go on a long walk off a short pier, uh, and they're going to meet anyways. I can, I don't even know the name of the church off the top of my head, but I just I just know there is one um, because some of the pastors were texting each other just trying to figure out if anybody knew the pastor or things like that. Uh, and, and look, there is a time and there, there would be a time, you know, depend, depending on how things went where, where grace could, could make that decision. We're not, we're, you know, it, and we don't feel like we're being targeted in any way. Like, like, I think that's the key targeted. Uh, yeah. And, and so if all of a sudden we felt like there was, this was actually persecution, then, then that might change. But, um, but right now we don't, we don't think that we don't think we're being persecuted. We, you know, our, we're, we're willingly giving up our constitutional rights for, for time um, uh, and, and, and submitting ourselves to the governing authority, which is our state and, and counties and things like that, our, our country. And that's what Romans 13 talks about is that, is that there's, a, there's, a role in, there's a role for government and, uh, and we need to submit to that. You know, and Jesus did say, you know, give the Caesars what is Caesars, but we will never give the Caesars what is God's. And, and so we, we, we kind of recognize there's a difference between those two. Um, and so there would, there is absolutely a time to say to the authorities, I'm sorry, we're going to, we're going to do what God calls us to do, not what you're asking us to do because our, our greater authority is God. Absolutely. hundred percent. Tr that's true. Um, but we shouldn't look and seek out reasons to, um, 
to buck the authority of the government because you know we're we don't we don't like the way things are or something so i just i just i just we need to be cautious about that there is a time and a place I, where that line is i think is unclear sometimes it's hard to tell sometimes it's very easy to tell um it just depends but for as far as right now with coronavirus and should we meet and stuff like that um it doesn't even matter what my personal opinions are about coronavirus or what the government should or shouldn't do and how they react to this uh for the moment i think it's right to to Submit. listen to the listen to the government the do what asking us to do mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. To submit to them yeah i agree with that i think like you said i think the biggest thing you said is there's no targeting you know um yeah. no apparent targeting at least you know of, yeah. of churches at, at least and not so right now like, now i know there's been some exceptions you know there there have been some governors and things that have, have absolutely targeted some churches but you know those have been um there's organizations like Alliance Defending Freedom or other other organizations like that that are defending those those people. And so far, the the courts have eventually, at least eventually, come to the right decision and said, you know, that was overreach or whatever. Like there's, you know, I, I can't remember one church. I think they got, I don't, I can't remember if the pastor got arrested, but they at least got fined for having like a drive-in church service. Oh, that's what I was going to talk to you guys about for staff meeting. Oh, okay. There you go. You well, Everybody. they don't. the The podcast doesn't want to hear about it. Yeah, so John, it's like, it just came to my head when I started. In talking case you're about wondering, that. in case you're wondering where where John's brain is at, so we had a staff meeting about an hour ago, and he yeah. had one more thing to talk about. And he could not remember, and he just remembered. I just so, remembered. And you guys don't need to hear about that. And so, yeah, not yet, not yet, not yet. But if we do it, you will. So, anyways. So it sounds um, like the teaser is something to do with driving. Yeah, the Either. teaser. Here, I'll, I'll give the teaser. I don't know if we're going to do it because there's a whole bunch of technical aspects of this that are complicated, but I think it could be really fun. Um, we're, I was thinking yesterday, and, and I needed to talk to Johnny and the rest of the staff about doing a drive-in worship service. Uh, not not Sunday morning service, but like an evening kind of drive-in thing. So uh, anyways, it, it, it would be a lot of fun. So it'd be like a, a, worship, a worship concert, but everybody would stay, stay in their cars and listen to it on the radios. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, here's my reaction. What? <laughs> hey. My actual reaction. Yeah. So there you go. Johnny just heard about Boy, it. You got to see it. See it live. Breaking news. Yeah, breaking news right here on the uh, Grace Deep Dive podcast. That's right. Hey, John, um, you talked about, well, this is, uh, well, I was going to ask you. So there was a point where you said something and, and I don't remember. I should have taken better notes. Um, but you said that it's, easier for humans to worship religion and not the god behind it essentially yeah what i what i said what did, what what I, was I, that? it was a quote it was a quote um uh oh by erskine thomas thomas erskine yeah of of lynn lathan which we have an erskine family in our mm -hmm. and a lawyer yeah who's a lawyer and this guy's also a lawyer so and it's just kind of i don't know who, who knows maybe, but, who knows maybe, maybe they're related but, maybe they're related but uh anyways our our erskine family it, you know he's a family lawyer and this erskine was a lawyer but, but yeah it, what he said is those who make religion their god will not have god for their religion so what what is that kind of can you kind of explain that a little bit yeah i think people get caught up in um you know religion has rules and traditions and that's there's there's nothing wrong with that um but um sorry my dogs are going crazy there's nothing wrong with with tradition and rules and religion necessarily but sometimes the the rules and the traditions and the 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 those things become the religion those are the those are the god uh instead of instead of god being the god and so they confuse the rituals and all that kind of stuff with god himself and it's kind of like what paul talks about in romans chapter one when he says they confuse the creator with the creation right and so it's kind of the same same concept whereas you know instead of worshiping the god that is established our religion if you will we worship the religion itself and a lot of people will say things like you know it's not a religion it's a relationship and that's not really true and i don't really like that phrasing because because in the book of james it talks about what true religion is and um things like that and so so christianity is a, is absolutely a religion in in a whole bunch of ways but it is also it includes a relationship with with jesus as our savior and so it's, it's really both um, but we don't worship the religion itself. The religion is a result of a loving God who, and, and uh, who sent it, his one and only son to pay the price for our sins on the cross and, and rose again, conquering sin and death. And we worship the God that did that 
we worship Jesus. We don't worship the religion that is, is uh, you know, that is created by that, if you will. You know, I think, I think one thing that I struggle with a lot is it, talking about authority even is sometimes I have um, such a, a respect for the authority of God in my life mm-hmm. that sometimes the heart has a hard time being cultivated because of the head being, my head being so understanding that, you know, it's like, it's almost like hard to, to, to connect in a loving way with somebody who has so much authority in your life. It's like, right. almost like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, I'll do, I'll fall. I will do that. I will do that. But the, the heart has a harder time for me connecting. Do you, does yeah. that make sense or? Oh uh, yeah, I can. I think, I think that's, uh, we might overplay that a little bit. I think, um, you know, for me, the way that looks is uh, I really like to, to read God's word and to study and those kinds of things. You know, the question becomes, does that lead to the, the relational side of, of knowing and loving God and things like that? And, and for me, I think of, I think it's, it's both. And I, I think this is too strong of a distinction, but um, a lot of times I, that's expressed in, in, you know, the more relational side of it is expressed in prayer. Although I think it happens in reading scripture as well, but um, and things like that. And so, um, yeah, I think it makes sense. Uh, you know, but my heart, when my heart's not there, I still want my head to be there. You know what I mean? I it needs wanna, to be a balance. Yeah. It needs to be both. And I want my head and my heart there. And, and sometimes I struggle a little bit more with the heart. Some people struggle a little bit more with the head. You know, they, they have no, no problem with the more relational side of things, but they struggle with studying God's word. Um, and that, that's, you know, different people have different struggles in that, but we need, we need all of it. Um, to engage in all of it, you know, prayer and study of God's word and the relational side of it, knowing that Jesus is a person, that God is a person. He's not, you know, some weird uh, force or something like that. It's, you know, there's, there's a person involved. And so expressing concern, emotions, um, being thoughtful, all those things matter. And that's all part of the relational side of it. But, but it's, it is a religion and it is a relationship. It's both. Yeah. I think it needs to be definitely well balanced because, you know, my problem is, is it's harder to cultivate the heart when the head is, is so strong in the sense of um, respect and awe and reverence. Yeah. And I think I see the, the flip side too. Sometimes if the heart is too big, then there's no, the reverence seems to lack sometimes. And yeah. it's almost like you need the head to, to steer the heart yeah. and need the heart to feel the, the head, you know? So you kind of need them both. It's right. good to have Absolutely. both. Um, hey, you talked about, and this is something that hits me a lot, and you know, it's why sometimes it's good to write sermons. I wouldn't want to do one every week or three a week like you did about two months ago. Yeah. But I think it's it's a it's good thing for a, or a pastor should be kind of wrecked by their sermon in a lot of ways, be uh, learning, you know, constantly. It's harder for the lay person to do that, but would you recommend some sort of, besides like a devotional, but would you recommend some sort of like, do we try to put together many sermons or do we challenge ourselves to maybe lead somebody in a certain way so that we're actually being uh, taken to the, to the grindstone of, of scripture? And because we know we're going to be presenting it and teaching it to somebody and it's going to be kind of be wrecking us, us as well. I mean, as a lay person, you know, that isn't doing the sermon. Right. Uh, do you recommend some sort of beyond just a devotion? Yeah, I see. Here's the thing: I struggle with the whole like, concept of devotions, not in the sense of doing them or whatever. I don't like the terminology, in, in part because it sounds like oh, I'm just going to read my daily bread or whatever, my little devotional that has a nice, cute story, has one verse in it, and then that's kind of my spiritual food. And I just that's not adequate, you know. That's like that's like always eating appetizers and never eating the main course, you know. Um, I think, I think we really need to dig into scripture. We need to have the main course, you know, Hebrews talks about, you know, you, um, you know, you're still, some of you are still drinking milk, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of on baby food, if you will. And you start to need to, you need to start feasting on the main, the main course. We need to study scripture. And so, you know, like for, and I'm going to actually talk about this on checking with pastor John tonight, uh, what my quiet times look like a little bit. Um, but you know, we need to go beyond just reading a cute story in a verse and calling it devotions. That's not what that is. I'm not even sure that's always helpful. I, I don't, we ought not just read a verse. Um, for the very reason that we talked about earlier in the podcast, when you talked about the castings pro before swine, we can pull a verse out of there and completely miss the context and get it completely wrong. We need to understand God's word, study God's word. You don't have to become a Greek scholar, a Hebrew scholar, 
you know, you know, get a get an MDiv or a master's in theology or something. Um, but to study God's word the best we can, you know, like like right now I'm reading through Revelation a lot, and and but I'm reading uh, other books that talk about how to understand Revelation at the same time. Um, I'm digging in deep, and the deeper I dig, that's more beneficial to me spiritually. Um, and I think people confuse that. They go, well, if I get really into the head part of it, where I would just study all the time, then it doesn't really feed my spirit. And I want, I want to say you're, that's messed up. That's really messed up, man. The, di- the deeper you dig into God's word, the more your spirit should hunger for it. And, and the more, you know, it's good for your spirit. It's, 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 that's not a good way to think about it. And I don't know where that comes from, but there are a lot of Christians who think that way. Um, you know, I, I have my devotional reading. I read, I read my, I read scripture for my devotions this way. And then when I study it, I read it this other different way. And I'm, I'm, that's weird. Don't do that. When you read scripture, there's, you know, we got to read to understand. And when we understand, we should, we should look to, to see how that applies to our relationship with God and our relationship with others and, uh, and then apply it. That's, that's, that's it. Anyways. I'll, I'll pontificate on that a little more tonight at checking with Pastor John if you're going to be there. There you go. See, there you go. A little teaser, a little trailer for you if you hear this in time. So Yeah, well, yeah. I don't know. It, you know, it depends. Hopefully, I'll get it up this afternoon. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, John. So, any um, additional resources you uh, came across this week? Uh, I got to think about this week. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, um, there was a uh, – I, I bought another book on – on miracles i'm trying to remember the name of it um um it was uh ian something uh can a scientist believe in miracles i think is the name of the book and and so just an interesting book he's a scientist if i remember right i think he teaches at uh the mit or some some major you know high high level uh university and uh and just a well-recognized scientist in physics and uh, he talks about what does a, can a scientist believe in miracles? And I think that's, uh, it's an interesting, I just started getting into it, but, uh, but that's another resource. If you're interested in more of that knowledge and epistemology and, uh, and philosophy, that's epistemology and philosophy of how we know things and, and whether, you know, a, a scientist can believe in miracles. I think that's really important for us to understand how a scientist could, because sometimes we worship science and I, I've talked about that before. And I think that's really a bad mistake to make a science is good and it's helpful and it's given it given to us by God. Um, but we can know a lot about the universe and even what's beyond the universe. Um, and science can't always tell us all, all, all that we can know. So, uh, so, and if you have, how, how can we believe in miracles? Cause this doesn't science explain everything. Well, here's a physicist, a world renowned physicist and he's, and he talks about it. So it's, uh, should be interesting as I read through it. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I haven't read it yet, but I've, I've listened to some of his YouTube videos. And I'm anticipating it'll be very good. So this is kind of the second time you've kind of mentioned supplementary uh, reading apart from scripture. John, can you, uh, can you learn, can you uh, have a good time with the Lord if you're not just reading the scripture? Yeah. Yes, you can. As a matter of fact, commentaries and yeah. Commentaries, nature, uh, you know, it talks about, your scripture talks about there's two. So when we talk about, this is a good, interesting conversation. Yeah, but there's, there's two different kinds of revelation, right? There's, there's general revelation in particular rev- revelation or some, some call it uh, um, general and, and special, but whatever your terminology, I like general in particular, but um, general revelation can be nature, you know, the study of nature, science, which is a study of the, the world and that we live in and things in the universe we live in. And that, and God speaks through that. It, 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 Psalms talks about it, you know, nature declaring the glory of God. And I think it's Psalm 8 and it was several, several Psalms actually, but I think Psalm 8 was one of them. Um, and so, you know, so we should, yeah, absolutely. You don't have to all, you know, I grew up, uh, in, well, where I went to college and I've heard, you've probably heard this too over the years, but you know, the, that phrase, all truth is God's truth. Um, and I, I think that's a good phrase in general. Uh, if it's true, if we're seeking truth, we can find that in a variety of ways. Scripture doesn't tell us all that is true, but it does get, it is sufficient for, our knowledge and understanding about God and about who he is and about us and about who we are and, and about why we need him and things like that. So, so scripture is sufficient for uh, our spiritual life and, and uh, things like that. But that doesn't mean we can't know other things about the universe, about all kinds of stuff. And that, that those things don't point to God. I think they absolutely do. 
or even listen to other believers write on it. Yeah, absolutely. God speaks through them. Now, I don't, I don't read a commentary and go, that's the divine word of God. That's scripture. Yeah. Right. That I treat them differently. Right. I can, cause commentaries will disagree and things like that. And so I evaluate, uh, you know, their view of, of God's word and I'll evaluate that and decide whether, uh, I think that's right or wrong based on how uh, the evidence that they present and things like that. But, um, but it's helpful to, to God gives insight to lots of people. And I, and I want to consider that even people outside the Christian faith, can give me insight into leadership or things like that. And so, so I want to pay attention to those things. It kind of also can help drive some creative juices, hearing some other thoughts on, on something kind of gets your mind going a different direction. Uh, can I just be honest? Like I am not creative enough or good enough or smart enough to uh, write sermons every single week and have them. Um, Differ and it will just be as, yeah, be as good as they are. Well, however good they are. I'm not saying they're, they're amazing, but I'm just saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not good enough creative enough to, to not have help from, from other people's insights. And, and, and I, so I very much enjoy that. And, and I think it, it feeds my soul. And not only does it feed my soul, it feeds me as a communicator of God's word to communicate better and more creatively and more effectively. I hope. Cool. Well, John, so what's the big idea this week as we, as we wrap it up? Well, the big idea is that quote from Thomas Erskine, those who make religion, their God will not have God for their religion. Thank you for joining us on the Grace Deep Dive Podcast, where we believe in real grace for real living. We'll see you next week.